The road to Fallout 3 was long and difficult. It began at Blackout Studios under Interplay, which was actually Titus Entertainment, and it ended there for a while with the cancellation of Van Buren. It would have remained buried forever were it not for an offer made by Bethesda, an offer that Interplay could honestly not refuse because it was going bankrupt. And by going bankrupt I mean it was bankrupt. The Fallout franchise was sold to Bethesda for a little over one million dollars. Basically nothing compared to what the series had achieved before this and what it would achieve after this. The sale was a bit of a sour note because the original developers, people like Leonard Boyarsky, were kind of sad on account of uh, Interplay owned Fallout, Titus owned Fallout actually, but he, Tim Kaine, Jason Anderson, Chris Taylor, they made it. They built it out of nothing. But it's important to know that at that time, Bethesda was most known for Morrowind, which was an absolutely excellent RPG. So spirits were actually kinda high at first, for the possibility that Bethesda would make a Fallout game. This would change a couple of years later when they released Oblivion, which was not what you would call the greatest RPG ever made compared to Morrowind in terms of the style of design, in terms of the complexity of the game in terms of the fact that it was a console game with horrible interface and controls compared to Morrowind. And then it came the day when Fallout 3 was announced, when Bethesda teased the trailer on the official site. I remember refreshing it constantly until it crashed and then we first got a glimpse of what uh, the game's intro would turn out to eventually be, part of it at least. It was an homage to the intro of the first Fallout, only now instead of a TV it was a radio, coming back to life, singing a song that was supposed to actually be in the first Fallout, Set the World on Fire by the Ink Spots, with a slow reveal of a bombed out destroyed Washington DC and ending with what else but a brotherhood soldier and that's when things started going wrong. Allow me to explain what I mean by this. Up until this point I had very high respect for the people that played Fallout. I knew what kind of games these were. I knew they not to insult people that don't play them but they require a certain degree of competence in language, in understanding game mechanics, a certain level of of reasoning. So for the longest time I consider people that play the Fallout games as being a bit more rational, more reasonable, more intelligent even than the average people that play Counter-Strike for 15 hours a day and nothing else and don't bother with games that have dialogue. Fallout 3 changed that for me. And I don't mean to say that uh, the game was so dumbed down that everybody could play it now even if they didn't read. No, no, no. I'm referring to the reaction of the Fallout community. They instantly hated it. You know the old saying, it's oblivion with guns, enough said. This was before they saw a clip of gameplay, before they pretty much knew anything about the game apart from the bit of CGI that we saw. They were throwing out arguments that were a bit loony honestly, like does this even look like a sequel to the intro Fallout 2? I'm not joking, someone that I consider a friend and a very knowledgeable player of Fallout issued that argument as a way of demonstrating that this game that he knew nothing about was not good. In the last couple of years he has come around and considers Fallout 3 as having its own distinctive unique features that actually make it enjoyable to play, but around the time it was being revealed and launched, I saw people that I believed, again, that would be a bit more reasonable, rational, descend into an absolute madhouse of hatred. I remember there was a, a list, an article, of reasons why Fallout 3 sucks. It was published like the day the game was released or something and half of the things on that list were absolutely wrong and not actually in the game. It even called Megaton, the first town you find in the game, Megatown and was making fun of the fact that it's called Megatown. Fallout 3 proved to me that I cannot make any assumptions about the fandom of a game ever because at its core a fandom is a group of emotionally charged human beings that turns into a mob, an angry mob whenever it perceives something that isn't to its liking. It doesn't matter if the game was Fallout. It doesn't matter that half the things they thought about Fallout 3 were false. It took about a year for the dust to settle down. 
and for people to actually appreciate the game for what it was. It wasn't the worst Fallout game. Again, the Brotherhood of Steel action game is the worst one. But it's not what you would call the greatest Fallout game ever made. And yet it tried to be Fallout. It is very, very flawed. Extremely flawed. It's a game that for the most part will not really give you all that much of a challenge provided you have at least the minimum amount of equipment on you. There are areas where it actually does try its best to outright kill you and I appreciate that. But in terms of balancing it wasn't really all that great or good. But thankfully it does come with full mod support so there is that. What I can appreciate about it is that it didn't have level scaling and it did try to be Fallout in other ways. It began with another monologue by Ron Perlman about the war, about humanity, and then it began with your character's birth, a very long introduction sequence that tried its best to explain to people how to walk, how to do everything, and attempted to sort of form a relation between your character and their father, who would be kind of the main character of the game. Make no mistake, you weren't the main character in Fallout 3. You were in the footsteps of the main character. You weren't the one doing things, you were after the person that was doing things. You were always one step behind. And it could have been done in a better way. It could have been done in a way that actually made you feel more impactful on the overarching story, but it didn't. One thing that I would like to point out in the intro of the game that I actually liked is uh, that you do get the uh, personality test. Now that's a staple of every Elder Scrolls game, or it was. I, I don't seem to remember if Skyrim had the questionnaire option of creating your class. And while you would be given statistics according to what you chose, the class you were assigned was uh, a complete joke. I got hairdresser. That's not a class in Fallout. That's, there's no classes in Fallout. Also, the last question in the GOAT test was uh, who is the one that watches over us and ensures our daily survival or something like that and all the options were the overseer. So it did try to be a bit subversive of its own baggage, of the expectations that people had. Try to poke fun at that. Sure, the rest of it was uh, kind of a um, haphazardly put together scene where you would escape the vault and not really have a diplomatic way out, which is kind of a bummer because Fallout sort of had a, uh, a design mantra. You give the player options. Sneaky, talky, shooty. You only had a shooty in this one and oftentimes you would have nuanced approaches between them. Fallout 3's intro wasn't really like that. Though to be fair the rest of the game did give you a bit more leniency towards you being able to approach a situation and resolve it in the way that you saw fit. Not necessarily just for violence. Though the violence was at the forefront of it. They were proud of their gib system where people would just explode like bloody mess was active constantly. I think you had bloody mess in the game but it just gave you more damage and actually improved the amount of gibbing you would get which I was kind of sad about. But not as sad as I was about the removal of the, well not the removal but the limitations they imposed upon fine aiming. They made the VATS system. A system that would not actually let you target parts of the body when you had a melee weapon which is an absolute shame. Being able to drag and kick people in the head was one of the highlights of Fallout 2. Not having that ability in Fallout 3 just seemed like a wasted opportunity. And most importantly they removed shooting people in the eyes because they believed well eyes and head are kind of the same. Okay yeah maybe sure. But they also did not allow you to punch kick, shoot people in the groin. I'm not sure why. This was a mature only game. Sure, it didn't have kids in it and a kind of people would get mad if you murder kids in video games nowadays. Oh, boo hoo hoo. The SRB won't let us. And some lame excuses about that. But shooting people in the groin, that, that was a highlight of Fallout. That was just cathartic. It, it was when you wanted to know that you really hated someone, you would shoot them in the scrotum. You would make sure their balls would fly off and 
there was a certain poetry in that and they just took it out and never put it back ever oh speaking of the combat system uh, the people that were complaining that they turned fallout into a shooter were then complaining that uh, having a low skill level on your uh, small arms caused you to basically deal kind of crappy damage and miss even though you were very close to an enemy's head it's almost like they uh, forgot that you were arguing that this wasn't rpg when they specifically complained about it being an rpg but going forward Fallout 3 is a bit of a different animal compared to the previous games because it had just one gigantic map that you could travel from point to point any way you wanted, in the direction you preferred, and basically do whatever you want around there. And yet it still managed to fit in the random encounters. Not just the special ones where you sometimes find an alien pistol where you would see a... you actually see a crashing satellite or something, I think it was Sputnik, but also had the idea that each individual cell, because because uh, the Netimerse engine, the Gamebryo creation engine, whatever it's called now, is built out of individual cells that are loaded and unloaded as you move through them. Each of them would generate their own random encounters when you enter them. You would see, for example, raiders fighting scorpions in front of a building that uh, was clear last time you went there. It sort of made it feel like a lived-in world a bit. It wasn't a great thing, but it worked would have worked better if the NPCs in the Megaton would not constantly jump to their death even though they were needed for quests. I think this was back before they uh, made every quest NPC immortal. I honestly kind of miss the days when they didn't have all the NPCs immortal. Oh, also the uh, the water in Megaton was irradiated so the NPCs when they walked through it they would get slightly irradiated and if they keep kept going and they would because they didn't have anything else to do they would get more irradiated and eventually die because of radiation poisoning which was kind of a neat thing had that been exploited at a, at a larger scale where you would have characters just spontaneously die of radiation poisoning because you know they didn't take your meds it would have been even funnier but it wasn't really that kind of life simulator kind of affair with the living world it just sort of seemed like it was alive but it actually wasn't. You could also again kill people by smuggling a live grenade into their pockets, which was always a fun thing to do. They called it the Shady Sands Shuffle, even though I don't think you could actually do it in Shady Sands. I mean, you had a very low pickpocketing skill then. It was just the beginning, unless you went back and killed everybody with uh, that uh, trick when you were more advanced in the game. Or you could just nuke people, not because you had an actual nuclear weapon launcher in the form of the fat man a weapon so obscene in power that you honestly probably would have never found it in the older games and again it was an instant win button the main reason you wouldn't use it constantly is because you would fight enemies indoors and guarantee your demise also um, if you want to see nuclear explosions you could uh, you could shoot a uh, parked car well there were a car there was a highway filled with them that would just cause a chain reaction killing everyone in that area but you could also blow up megaton with the nuke that was causing all that irradiated water in the first place and here's where the game sort of proved it wasn't really up to snuff in terms of the quality of the writing the plot the characters compared to the other ones you basically had no reason to blow it up unless you were evil and i mean just mustache twirling tying people to the train tracks for no reason evil when they made the game, they didn't really understand, for the most part, the idea of new ones. So you can be evil without being a psychotic, cannibalistic, murdering bastard. You can be evil by degrees. You can be evil by other means than causing mass genocide. You could either be super duper the best person ever or literally the devil. There was very little in between and the karma system it had did not really help since it was based on the idea idea that if you killed someone that was evil you'd get good karma even though you had no idea that person was evil and maybe the people around you had also no idea that that person was evil but you still got good karma it uh, had a couple of flaws much like Morrowind had flaws where you would uh, get instantly attacked by everyone in an end if you picked a petal off a flower which is honestly something that even the Venti original sin 2 has and the problem with nuance was also extended to the uh, the dialogue itself 
it was consolified. And by that I mean that they shortened the dialogue so that it would fit on consoles, on the console screen without boring the player. It had a few options, they were really small, really tiny. It didn't have screens of dialogue, it didn't have words that flowed, it didn't have intelligent arguments, you didn't have pretty much any of that. You had, for the most part, fluff and filler. And that was a major disappointment. The writing uh, at game actually won awards for writing, though to be fair, the same people that give awards for writing to Bioware that go by the idea that, well, it's a lot of it, so it must be good, yup, yup, yup. No. Trust me, this comes from a writer that is about to finish a book that's 150 words long. Just because it's long doesn't mean it's good. Tale of Doom isn't good. It's just long. You heard it first from me. Well, it's, it's half decent at least. Though to be fair, there were certain areas where the writing was a bit better. I mean, it didn't. It wasn't consistently good. For the most part, it was mediocre, with certain tiny highlights. And the same thing can be said about the majority of the quests. Some of them were a bit interesting. Like you had one in the river town in the old battleship where you were supposed to find a person that was actually a synthetic android. But he had no idea who it was, and he had to find them, which to me it seemed like a great idea for a quest. Like, any one of these people could be actually an android. It was a bit... Uh, deflated by the fact that every quest in the game is essentially a follow waypoint marker type of affair, meaning that you pay less attention to the quests themselves and more to the pointer on the screen. This is a problem that Bethesda has had ever since Oblivion. They did not have it in Morrowind. In Morrowind they beautifully, very beautifully described everything they could. They told you what the character would be wearing, so you'd know where to find them and how they looked. But here they wanted to make sure that people didn't get lost, that people of all kinds of preferences in terms of gaming, you know, the non-reader types would be able to enjoy it. And it's a compromise that I wholeheartedly loathe. But still I can say that I hate the game itself. There are bits of it that I enjoy. You can put a ghoul mask on and pretend to be one, and the other ghouls would leave you alone. You can explore the wasteland, the capital wasteland, and you'll find places that are lifted directly out of the Fallout Bible. In terms of lore, it tries to be very accurate. Doesn't do well on characters, doesn't do well on motivations of the factions of the individuals in the Fallout universe. Characters, by the way, I don't remember any of them. Well, Moira, because she had a nice joke about stitching smileys in your well, wounds when you want to get stitched. But there were no interesting characters in the game. They were better as the characters. The places you visited, though, they were interesting. There was a vault filled with clones of the same guy named Gary who would go around yelling Gary and try to kill you. There was an area that you would visit uh, because you were forced to buy the story where you would be integrated into a uh, virtual reality type of affair where you would be a kid in a black and white sitcom -y, old timey TV show kind of affair and your pip boy would get turned into a watch with the vault boy watch face. That was something unique. That was something you did not see in the older games. It was something they made for this one and it's, it's something that fit into this world, into this version of Fallout. And something that I really, really liked was the style they went for. Visually, it looked like Fallout should look. With the old archaic computers, the old timey style cars, and something that I absolutely loved the radio. In your games you'd only get one song. You'd get Maybe in Fallout 1 and What a Wonderful World in Fallout 2. But in this one you got fed that classic music non-stop. And I felt that that just fit. It was a great idea that worked. It gave the game a more of a sense of a, of a tone, of an atmosphere, of a mindset that you were supposed to be in. That yeah, this was the future, but mentally people were at best stuck in those 1950s, 1940s jingoistic thought patterns. And it would also have something unexpected, a DJ by the name of Three Dog, and I actually remember being referenced in a previous games uh, in the credits, I believe, or something. Maybe it was something that they added in the re-release versions. And that DJ would uh, basically give you information about what was going on in the world, about your progress. And a very important thing, they used him to shift 
the ending slides that you would get at the end of a Fallout game to within the game itself. That's a distinction that some people did not pick up on and I'm kind of sad about it because I felt it was a good idea. When you finished a quest, a big one I mean, an important one, uh, one that would have generated a different kind of ending for a certain area, you wouldn't get the final resolution at the end. You would get it sometime after you finished the quest from 3Dog. He would say, well, because the hero something something didn't murder everybody and actually did some good, now that town is doing sort of a bit better. Now it couldn't really go super duper into the future and show you what would happen to that town in 80 years, but it gave you a general idea of what was to come, of what was expected to happen in that town. All in all, Fallout 3 is kind of horrible when it comes to gameplay when you compare it to the older games. I mean, people, Fallout fans back then would complain it was first person shooter, but you could play it third person. The camera could actually pan out until you're basically top down the size of your thumb, pretty much isometric. But in terms of gameplay, it, it doesn't have the same depth. It doesn't have the same tactical vibe to it. The same kind of insane satisfaction of kicking someone in the groin so hard that they exploded. He also did have traits which meant that you couldn't really give yourself like a big disadvantage or an advantage that caused something else. You couldn't really make a lopsided character even if you had zero intelligence you were still kind of eloquent apart from some very very few isolated situations where this was taken into account. Like you, you could tell that at least some people on the design team tried but for the most part they had to make it big flashy suitable for a console market that did not enjoy reading which is very very sad. I like to mention that I didn't play uh, all the DLCs, I only played the first one Operation Anchorage and it was uh, it brought back the the Gloss Rifle but uh, it, uh, no not really that interesting and it was not worth the money. Did not play Broken Steel which means that when my character got to the end my character died even though I had Fox with me and I told him hey you wanna hop in that thing and you know you're radiation immune so uh, go in there press the button come back out We'll have a beer. He went down with something that no, this is my destiny. Also, you're an asshole. So yeah, you should go die. I know you killed so many mutants before. So oh boy, I didn't want you to live. I'm kind of imagining that that was the actual reason why he didn't want to go in. They sort of wrote themselves into a corner uh, in that situation by having the idea that you, you'd play the character from the moment they were born to their death. But then they gave it the ability to send companions in there. It would have just been easier to not allow you to have companions with you at that point. Heck, even kill them. Murderize all your companions. Have the last bit of the game be absolutely murderous. Well, technically it was, but you were the one doing the murdering and a kind of you were joined by the Brotherhood of Steel and all their army and honestly, one of the best things in the game, a giant robot called the Liberty Prime that you would just see standing around in the Brotherhood base for hours and days and months and then you'd see it in action. Oh my god, was it the funniest thing ever. It was amazing. It just tore through everything it killed every it blew up it it was superb as a spectacle i mean in terms of gameplay it was uh it reduced the game to being the raster it was a walking simulator at that point and the way they could have fixed it would have been okay the robot does its thing it kills everything it it just pulverizes all the things and then uh it gets hacked yeah somehow the enclave hack it and it turns on you and starts killing everyone you know and then you go on with the, the final boss battle against i, I honestly have no idea. Again, the characters in this game were, for the most part, horrible. Liam Neeson was in it. I can't remember anything he said. Anything at all. I don't know who the main enemy was. It was the Enclave. They wanted to either shut down the water purifier or, uh, oh yeah, contaminate it so it would kill the, the mutants and you could talk them out of it. Can't remember the arguments. I actually believe they don't matter because arguing in this game was again the worst in terms of actual logic and dialogue and arguments. But again, I can't bring myself to hate it. There are parts of it I like. The sense of exploration, of going around the wasteland, finding Harold from the old games, killing him, finding an immortal dog meat that would murderize everything. I understand why people liked it. 
I understand why some people dislike it because it's a Fallout game. It wasn't very good at being Fallout. It was in places terrible at being Fallout. But it still respected the aesthetic of it, the lore for the most part. Again, motivations for some factions were who. Oh. But I can't understand the sheer panic induced hatred of it that first appeared. The knee jerk reaction that that just made me clock out out of every fan club, fandom, forum anything because eventually that's what they would all be reduced to. Fallout 3 was followed by the idea of an MMO called Project V13, Fallout Online. It was being developed by Interplay by some of the people that worked on the original Fallout. I believe it was Jason Anderson and Chris Taylor, not the Total Annihilation, Chris Taylor, the other one. Only the thing is that Interplay, and by Interplay I mean Titus wearing the decayed, decrepified skin suit of Interplay, didn't have the exact rights to do it. Well, they, they had rights for the MMO if they had actually done any work up to a certain point at a certain time, which they didn't, and they lost the rights. So that game is now being developed as its own thing, though to be fair, Fall of Earth was pretty much as close as uh, we would ever get to a Fallout Online up until uh, Bethesda makes one. And by makes one, I mean they're making one now. They're working on it. How do I know this? Well, they've got an MMO that's out. It's been out for years. And that studio is just laying around, doing, in quotation marks, nothing. So you be the judge. And after that, we of course got Fallout New Vegas, which was a stark improvement in terms of writing quality, in terms of nuance compared to Fallout 3, but in my eyes it didn't improve on things enough. It still had bits of it that just felt shoehorned in and kind of fillery, especially with that airbase quest thing that people just assume that, hey you, yeah, we want to reintegrate back into the world, so you're gonna have to do all these things for us. I'm like, why? I don't know. Still, New Vegas was made by Obsidian in 18 months. They did not have time to do things properly. They did not have time to integrate groin shots and kicking people in the eye. So it was probably as best as as they could make it. And then we got Fallout Shelter, which uh, seemed like an actual game uh, when it was released. Turned out it wasn't. It was still one of those clickers, but it, 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 it looked like an actual game. And we got also Fallout 4, which is a massive Minecraft effect in the Fallout universe. It is a game that I have not played, but from what people have told me consistently, it's a game where you can't tell people to just fuck off when they give you a quest, which is kind of uh, the least Fallout thing possible. I mean, the older games, they had absolutely masterfully crafted ways of telling people to shove their own problems up their own asses and go away. There was a bit where you, you would go the guy into cutting off his own finger and then making him eat it as a process of denying the quest he was imploring you to take. That was evil. And it was evil without having to blow up a town for no reason. Though again, you could still murder everything in the old Fallout games, but you had to do it a bit more personal. Fallout 3 was in places a bit too, too impersonal. And that would be about it. That's the entire story of the Fallout series. Six games, seven if you count the one that sucked, eight if you count the mobile one, stretched over 20 years. 20 years to the day tomorrow, the 30th of September. If you've never played the series before, I, I hope I have encouraged you to at least give the old titles a try. Fallout 1 and 2 especially, they are among what you would call the pinnacle of design in role-playing games. They are surpassed probably by Arcanum and not in terms of combat. And if you're one of the people that absolutely hated Fallout 3, for reasons that may have not been absolutely correct. You could give it a go again, or probably already playing New Vegas, so why bother? And be on the lookout in, oh, 
guessing it's going to be another year at least before they announce the MMO. So 2018-2019, be on the lookout for Fallout Online. Now I may be wrong about it, but I haven't fired everybody involved in design and production that doesn't really relate to making DLC for Elder Scrolls Online. They've got to be working on something. And they did spend quite a lot of time in court getting Fallout Online back. So have a good Fallout anniversary everybody and be sure to check out our friend Steven Nonsense videos about why you should play the Shadowrun games. Goodbye. War. War never changes.